Brother Clay is the pastor at Dynamic Baptist Ministries in Kansas City, Kansas. He's also the executive director for uh, Baptist Fellowship Association. He'll be sharing some of that along the way. We'll get to know more about him, yeah, I'm sure, as he presents. I'm glad that he and his wife Stephanie are able to join us. Uh, also want to welcome those of you from Ambassador Baptist Church. You're spread around a little bit. Glad you could join with us this evening as well. And with that, Brother Clay, all yours. Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. If I was at home, I would say you guys got to respond like they do down at Arrowhead Baptist Fellowship, where Patrick Mahomes is the lead pastor, <laughs> Andy Reid is the high bishop. And, uh, everybody gets really excited. They show up six hours early for service. <laughs> Fellowship in the parking lot. They uh, break bread together. They see even some of them pray together. They uh, share uh, spirits to get filled with the spirit <laughs> so that they can go and have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful worship session. And so I think we ought to be more excited for eternity than they are for the temple. Yes. <laughs> and I think we got to do a better job than what we're doing. So thank you, Pastor Schultz, uh, Dr. Schultz, Dwight, got to get all the names in. <laughs> some of you are academic, and why don't you call them Dr. Schwartz? And some of you say, why are you not? You guys supposed to be friends. Why don't you call them Dwight? So, I'm just all the titles in and out the way. And that way, I don't disrespect anybody. Hopefully, preferably. And, um, it's a privilege to be here with you. We've been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, I have a busy travel schedule, but I really look forward to this because this is really something that's very passionate in my heart. Um, for a long time. I'd like to introduce my lovely wife of 35 years, Stephanie. Uh, she's, uh, she deserves battle pay. <laughs> she has uh, been my partner in crime against the things of Satan and the kingdom of Satan for a long time. And uh, I would not be the man that I am without her. So I just want to say thank you publicly to her before all of you. And I mean that sincerely because, and she knows that I meaning because I normally don't talk about these kind of things. <laughs> but uh, she is a wonderful, wonderful helpmate. And, uh, we have two children. Tyler is our son. He's our oldest. And we have a daughter, Janessa, who has recently got married a couple years ago and just recently had our first grandchild. So we're grandparents. We're old. <laughs> we are officially old. <laughs> she likes it more than I do. <laughs> she loves all the meat and all that. I'm not used to the paw paw stuff yet. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. So you guys have to pray for me. Uh, but we have a wonderful family and uh, we're just thankful. And if you haven't noticed, my wife does not look like me. I, I didn't know if there was any colorblind people in this place. So, uh, I just want to let you know. And uh, we have never, ever had a fight or a disagreement right. or a problem that was related to our skin color. No. <laughs> suburban guy. I grew up in the city till I was 12 in St. Louis. We moved to the suburbs and, uh, and I went to school and college in a rural community. So I've been in all three worlds. So there's nothing you can say or do that would shock me. I've seen it all and uh, experienced it all in, in a number of ways. And So really multi-ethnic uh, ministry uh, was a part of my makeup, was a part of my life even before God called me into ministry. Um, we lived in St. Louis, as I said, predominantly African-American, grew up in that context, along with being born into an African-American family. And then we moved to Florissant, Missouri, which is the suburbs. And um, when we first moved there, you could count the number of people who looked like me on maybe two hands. You go back there now, you can count the number of people who look like her on two hands. <laughs> The 
whole community has changed in 30 something years to where I don't even recognize it. Um, uh, our church, uh, the high school I went to is predominantly Caucasian. Uh, my sophomore year, they began to bust in uh, predominantly African American students from a subset uh, area. And our, our church, our high school became very diversified very quickly overnight. And um, I don't remember a lot of racial issues. And this was in, I tell my age, 1978, 77, 79. And so we didn't have those problems. Our team, our basketball, I played basketball in high school. Our team was much like that old movie, the old show um, with the, the the white coach with the black basketball players. We had that diversity and we just all got along. And basketball was our thing. And uh, I also played baseball and then went to college to a predominantly rural college. Uh, I was the only African American who was on the travel squad. Um, my best friend on the team was the catcher. I was at his wedding uh, in our, after our sophomore year, one of his groomsmen. And, uh, so I understand all the questions. I understand all the fears. I understand all the issues because I have lived it all my life. So coming into ministry, uh, thinking about multi-ethnic ministry was just a natural outworking of my whole life. And, uh, so I know the things that you don't want to say I know the things you would like to say that you're scared to say. I would just like to let you know that you can say them with me. And we'll clean it up and we'll fix it up because I understand that one of the reasons the church has not been able to solve and deal with this problem is because we have not let the Bible be the final authority on this issue. And I am a Bible fanatic. I believe the word of God means what it means. It says what it says. I don't think God is confused and neither should we. Right. <laughs> but we've been confused on this racial, this ethnic, this prejudice and bigotry issue for far too long in the church. And I believe the church is the only one that has the ability to demonstrate to the world how we live unified with diversity. We're not trying to be all the same. God didn't make us all the same. But he did unify us because of the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross because we all had a common problem and we all need the same common solution. Mm -hmm. Whether you're Jew, Gentile, black, white, pink, polka dot, neon, cleon, zeon, whatever. You're born in sin. We can all trace our roots right back to the garden. And we all need the same Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Everything else, we work out as we go. But I understand in my dissertation, I wrote <coughs> a section, why do we still have the problem in the church? I'm not surprised, and neither, none of us should be surprised that the world can't solve the problem because Satan kids are not trying to solve the problem. Satan is trying to create and keep this unity. But Christ died to bring unity in the body of Christ. He prayed about that in John 17, that they would be one as you and I are one. That's the definition of unity. The Trinity is the definition of unity. The Trinity is the picture of unity. Anything less than that is not unity. You can't change the definition if Christ defined the definition. And Christ died to make that unity possible. He rose again with all power to make that unity possible. He ascended to the right hand of the Father and acts as our high priest to make that unity possible possible. But one of the things you might not know from that text, if you have not read it closely, he says that unbelievers would believe that he is who he is because of the unity that we demonstrate. And one of the reasons that our witnessing has lost effectiveness in the culture and has not had the effect that it should have is because we have not demonstrated the unity that the world needs to see so they could believe in Jesus Christ. You guys can say amen. <laughs> <laughs> this is interactive. I, I want, I, there's a lot of stuff I can say. I've done this in a number of places. But I really want to help you. 
with the questions and thoughts that you're struggling with and that you have. That's really my goal. I can give you information that will excite you or bore you, depending on where you're at. But I really want to deal with where you're at and what questions you're dealing with and things that you're struggling with because our culture is very confused. And not only is our culture very confused, our churches are very confused. Pastors are confused. Members of the churches are confused. we got all this new fangled terminology that's floating through the air that it's hard to keep up with all of it because it's something new every week, if not every day. Uh, we've gone from being woke, which is really the night of the living dead people, but they just don't know they're dead. <laughs> We've gone from cancel culture, we've gone from CRT, we've gone from gender issues, we've gone from redefining diversity to include everything and everybody and everything that everybody wants to include. And it's just confusing. It's just hard to keep up with, uh, even as a pastor. And for me, reading on this stuff and following this stuff is, is just a nightmare because there's something new coming down the pike faster than you can learn about the one that just came out yesterday. And so what I would challenge you, for those of you who are pastors and those of you who are teachers, learn the Bible. Don't spend a lot of time studying all this new stuff. They tell you the way that, uh, that they train uh, people in the government to determine counterfeits is that you handle the real thing. You don't handle the fake stuff handle the real thing. You become so familiar with the real thing that you can determine anything that's fake. We need to become more familiar with the gospel. Because I believe, based on the Bible, that the gospel is the solution to the ethnic racial divide in the church. The way we deal with the racial ethnic divide is the principles of the gospel. And what I mean by that is this. The greatest divide, division that has ever been has been between God and man. So the question would be, if that's the greatest divide, what did God do to bridge and reconcile that divide? And whatever God did, that's what we ought to be doing to bridge the divide among us. But do we really understand the gospel? Do we understand the outworking of the gospel? I wonder, as I talk to people, as I listen to people, as I look at the church climate and the church culture, I don't know if we really understand the gospel. And I really do believe we don't understand the outworking of the gospel. What I mean by that, what God intended to accomplish by the gospel is just as important as the gospel message. And what he intended in the gospel is that the two people groups that everybody's identified with in the Bible is that Jew and Gentiles, according to Ephesians <coughs> chapter 2, would become one new man. You can say amen. <laughs> I'll keep you in on the amen. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus adopted, was buried, rose again, the atonement satisfied the wrath of God against sin. But it also was to take the Jew and Gentile and make them one new man. See, this is why I don't go to unity meetings. I'm not trying to get unified with people. I'm already unified with people who are in Christ. Christ is a good man. Going to unity meetings, talking about how we can be unified, has gotten us nowhere. <coughs> All these marches and all these, I'm not a march and protest guy, by the way. I'm just, I don't see it as a biblical strategy. Now, you guys are cool with that, but there are certain groups I go talk to who look opposite of you, who are not cool with that, because then you're attacking and dealing with certain uh, leaders who they relish and cherish very highly. But I believe the gospel is the strategy, not marches. I believe born again people already have the solution. We need to take the born again solution to other born again people. And that's why the Holy Spirit is so important in the church. 
I believe one of the missing factors, we don't understand the Holy Spirit is really the glue that keeps us all together. Because we are different. There's unity in diversity, and there's diversity in unity. It's not about sameness. And let me, let me help you. Don't say you're colorblind. That's an insult to a lot of people. You need to recognize shades. I don't even like the word color. Shades. We're just different shades. But at the essence of what really makes us human, we're all the same. We're all the same. And we're even more in sync because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. But the culture wants to make us all the same. Churches want to make us all the same. Listen, I like country western, but it's not my necessary preference. But if you like country western, guess what? I like country western because I love you. I don't have to like country western. That's an amen moment. <laughs> somebody likes jazz and you don't like jazz should not divide us. But what's one of the biggest things that divides churches on Sunday morning? Worship music. Worship styles. Now, there are some things that we need to be careful about. But the fact that it's not your style should not divide you from someone else who is their style. In other words, if we're really going to build multi-ethnic churches, we need to build churches where people see themselves as a part of the church. But if I let my preference that we try to make be illogical, because we're more academic than we are safe, then we'll keep the church divided and we'll keep the church sectioned off in the corners. Why not? Let everybody see themselves in the worship service. Does anybody know Revelation chapter 5 where we sing a new song? Can anybody tell me what beat that will be? Would that be a three measure? Would it be a two? What measure would that be? What will be the rhythm? And, and, and please help me. I must have missed the rehearsal where we all learned the words of the song. How are we going to sing in unison and there was no rehearsal? Because all of us will be focused on one person and one person only. The Lamb. Amen. That sits on the throne. Well, we're supposed to be practicing that on earth. He's supposed to be the focus. But we have made ourselves the focus and our preferences the focus. And we stay in our little sections. Divided. And it's just not biblical. It's not God on Because Christ died to unify us. We have no right to separate or fractionalize what God has unified. Any questions on that? That's a lot in just a short introduction, but any questions on that? Alright. Let me read this introduction and I know it's not in your book, but let me read this. This is the article taken from Answers Insider, May 2021. God created man, the humankind, on his, in his own image, after his likeness, Genesis 126. All descendants of the first man and woman are literally one race, one God. If you haven't read Ken Ham and Charles Worth's book, One Blood, you need to read. The science will blow you away. We are not <coughs> that. Just have different shades. <coughs> and we're divided over shades. Like we're shopping for clothes. And we have no right <coughs> to divide what Christ died to you. So one of the reasons we have not been able to deal with this issue in the church is because we don't call it sin. Because if we call it sin, then we know that the gospel is the solution to that problem. But if we call it all these other things, then you deal with symptoms, you don't deal with the root. And I'm a root kind of guy. 
I don't want to go out and pull up weeds. I want to take it all up the ground so I don't have to go out and pull them up anymore. If you come to me as a doctor, I am a doctor, but I'm not a medical doctor, and I didn't sleep at a Holiday Inn last night. <laughs> and you got headaches. You're complaining about headaches. And we do a CAT scan, and it shows that you have a tumor. And all you want me to do is prescribe aspirins or medicine for your headache. You want me to treat the symptom. You don't want me to treat the root cause. Because if we take the tumor out, you won't have headaches and you won't need aspirin. And the problem in the church, we keep dealing with symptoms. We won't deal with the root cause. And the root cause of all this is sin. And the only solution to sin is the cross. The gospel. And I'm not interested in dealing with symptoms. There's too many of them. There's too many of them. There's a new one coming up all the time. I want to get to the root. And the root of this racial stuff, this ethnic stuff, I, I don't even like the word racial, but we use it because we're familiar with it, is sin. I don't like you because I've been indoctrinated with various philosophies, like Darwinism, that teaches that some people are less than other people because of this and because of that. The other problem, as I worked through my dissertation, was fear. Some of us are just fearful of losing our place, our status. Right now, many of you are in the majority group, but you better get ready. Because based on the studies I've done, by 2050, you're going to be in the minority. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you a little secret that they don't tell you on television. The people who've been the minority all this time, when they get to be the majority, y'all in trouble. When they get the power, they're going to be seeking revenge. I know this because I talk to groups who don't look like you, who are talking just like that. And by the way, many of our Asian and Hispanic and the Pauli brothers that work with our community are trying to figure out why is it just a black and white issue? What about us? Amen. <laughs> what about us? I've been to. I went to a conference one year, and uh, the most mature people, who are supposed to be most mature people in the room, pastor and their wives, and we were talking about this issue, and we we're talking about the civil rights movement, and the statement was made by one of the pastor's wives. Let those people go get their own civil rights movement and stop piggybacking off of ours. And the saddest thing, even though it's, that was a sad statement, nobody in the room corrected that person. So I'm an equal opportunity to get an owner, people, get an owner. <laughs> You know, I go to conferences and some people say, do he talk to his people like he talked to us? And, and I go, does he talk to them? He does both. <laughs> <laughs> he gets on both. Because wrong is wrong. Sin is sin. And when we're not acting like Christ, we need to say something. Now we do it with love, we do it with kindness, we do it with patience, but we got to stop skipping <clears throat> sin and sinful attitudes and sinful behaviors. And so I did pull her aside and have a conversation with her after the meeting. And she did apologize to me. Because it, it just, that's not an attitude that we should have as Christians. Okay. And that really wasn't the mindset of some of those early people who did that work who came before us. Adam and Eve were fruitful and multiplied greatly on the earth, but even before their first child was conceived, they disobeyed their creator. Because they sinned, God judged humankind and all creation by the curse and later by the global flood. Of all humans alive <clears throat> at the time, only the family of righteous Noah was spared. At the Tower of Babel, God once again judged humankind when he confused their languages and scattered them over the earth. The people traveled to different locations and likely married only within their small group at that time, isolated groups. As a result, different physical features, skin shade, eye shape, physical build and more became more prominent. 
groupings also develop unique cultures that all share a common heritage. Though humanity possesses many different physical characteristics, there is but one race, the human race. There's only one race. That's why I don't like the word race. Really, the word is ethnos in the, in the Greek. It's mean at people groups. There are many people groups. Diversity, there is unity. One <coughs> That's an amen moment. <laughs> the unity is one human race. The diversity is many ethnos people groups. So the goal is not to make all the human race alike. God likes diversity. And I'll prove that from the creation narrative here in a minute. All people descend from those dispersed at Babel and from the family of Noah that left the ark. We are created by God, according to Genesis 2.7. We are all created in God's image, Genesis 1.26. We are all one family, according to Acts 17.26. We are all loved by God and have the same offer of salvation in Jesus Christ. And we all have the same need of that salvation. Right. Yes. Do you really believe that? Yes. Then why do you walk by people who don't look like you and don't say anything? If they're all on their way to hell, out their mouth's womb, and we're the only rescue team God's got, why are we being selective in who we share with? I know y'all didn't come here for conviction, but hey. <laughs> These questions have to be asked. One of the things I studied in the study of multi-ethnic principles or multi-ethnic churches, the reason our churches stay mono-ethnic is because the people sitting in the pews don't reach people who don't look like them out in the community, at the store, on their jobs, in their neighborhoods. Because if you were reaching people who looked like didn't look like you, and you invite them to your church because you know that's where they're going to get discipled and fed, then your church couldn't stay monoethnic very long. But the old adage that we used to do in old missionary work is that we would take the person, take their soul out the person, witness to their soul, their soul would get saved, stick their soul back in their body, and then say, well, you don't look like me, so you need to go somewhere else. Do you see Jesus ministry like that in the Bible? John 4, he went to the Samaritan woman. He took the soul out of her, witnessed to the soul. She got saved, took the soul back in the body, and said, you're on your own now. So we have developed some practices, which leads to the third reason. Darwinism had a big impact. Uh, fear has a big impact. But the misappropriation of scripture had the other impact. To where it became normal culture, it became normal for certain people groups who were looking down at other people groups to teach that the Bible said they are less than the majority of people groups. So you come up with the curse of Ham in Genesis. There's no curse of Ham in Genesis. It was one of Ham's sons that were cursed. Not him. So you can't say all of his relatives should be slaves when the curse was on one son, not all the sons. That's an amen moment. <laughs> <laughs> but that was used and taught in seminaries, written in the notes of certain study Bibles, because the majority culture taught that. Rate is just high for people who are different ethnic groups. 
people of the same ethnic group don't have a divorce rate? <laughs> what are we saying? The problem is we're saying that. Anytime you get two sinners or two saints who are trying to live safely in the same house, you're going to have problems. <laughs> I don't care if they're a different ethnic group or the same ethnic group. It's going to be problems. And I tell people all the time, you got to take people in your marriage counseling from Disneyland to Jurassic Park. Because <laughs> they come in thinking Disneyland about marriage. And we do the same thing in the church. But it's really Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> there are Disneyland moments. There's a lot of Jurassic Park moments too. <laughs> Disneyland will take care of itself. Jurassic Park gonna take some work. Okay. And so it's the same thing when it comes to this subject. When it comes to the same thing with relationships with one another, you, you got to work through those things. And one of the things that I, I, I'm so proud of with the BFA, they have. Um, made some changes to where we want to be the group, we want to be the organization that says, hey, we're not mad, we're not upset, we want to have conversations. We want to have conversations. You would be amazed in my travels how much I've heard, I get to travel a lot to Bob Kai seminaries and, and speak there, how many of them don't have a diversified staff, and the first thing they say is we can't find African Americans or Hispanics who are biblically sound. What? I know where a whole bunch of them are. But if you hear that, far too often. And so we're trying to bridge that. We're trying to be that group. We're trying to um, get people who have the same mindset, like myself and your pastor. Hey, why, why don't we partner? Why don't we have an association where we come together and we show something different? Why are we over here and you over there? And we say we believe in the same Jesus, that we've been saved by the same Christ, that we've been washed in the same blood, but we're segregated. <coughs> That's a challenge for some of my Caucasian brothers. Because there's a fear. I told you fear is one of the problems. If I join your association, then my other brother who look like me are going to be whispering. Because as much as we say we're equal, as much as we say we're brothers and sisters in Christ, when the rubber meets the road, they stay over there and they tell us to stay over here. I'm trying to kick down those walls and break down them doors. Amen. So thank you for having me here, and uh, you only have to put up with me for a couple of days. <laughs> the superficial physical difference between us are a reflection of the tremendous genetic diversity that God placed in the crown jewel of his creation of humankind. The diversity is God's idea. You can't get mad at somebody else because they don't look like you. You didn't have anything to do with you looking like you. <laughs> None of us got to select the gene pool before we came out the womb. Jeremiah would tell us we were shaped and formed in our mother's womb by God. Amen. So how do you hold the fact that somebody is not of your ethnic group against them when they didn't have name to do it? Go talk to God <laughs> and tell him how you feel. But I can't see God right now, so I got to go at the people. Not realizing there's an enemy who wants you to do exactly that. And keep this thing divided because here's the key God works best in unity, Satan works best in disunity. And you better discern the difference. So he's done a good job of keeping this thing going, hasn't he? And he uses people just like God uses people. So let's get into this a little bit. 
No, I think we have proof. Martha after the birth in creation. Let's go to Genesis. <coughs> we won't spend all our time here. We'd like to spend hours doing this. Most of you are familiar with the creation narrative, right? You know, there was no problem, there was no division between Adam and Eve until Genesis chapter 3. There was no division between Adam and Eve and God until Genesis chapter 3. Everything was exactly as God designed it. Right? And the text says that God made plants and he made animals and they produced after their own kind. So let's visit the clouds. Are all clouds the same? I know it's been a while since you've been in school, but are clouds the same? <laughs> There's different kinds of clouds, right? But they're all what? Clouds. Clouds, unity, diversity of clouds. Anybody got a cat? How many kinds of cats are there? But they're all what? Unity and diversity. Anybody got a dog? How many got dogs up there? But they're all what? Dogs. Unity and diversity. It's all over the creation area. And God, the Bible says God made the grass, right? Is all grass the same? But all grass is what? Grass. Unity. Y'all getting the point here? <laughs> It's all grass, right? But it's different types of grass. And each grass, each animal, each cloud, its beauty is beautified in its own uniqueness. Then why do we think as human beings we all got to be same? Humans are many different ethnic groups. Unity and Y'all good, y'all get this, y'all get this. <laughs> it takes some people a little time to catch up with what we're doing. <laughs> so we see multi-ethnic diversity in the creation narrative. Right? Aren't you happy, ladies, that your man is not quite like you in every way? <laughs> and man, aren't you glad your wife is not quite like you in every way? I know the gender people and the A, B, C, D, E, F, G people are all confused. But the two shall become one flesh. Unity and diversity. So why is it when it comes to this ethnic racial issue we so confused when it's all over the place? And how much more should it be amplified now that we all are in Christ? Because as an enemy, he wants to keep the mess going. There's a mission that we have as the body of Christ that he doesn't want us to accomplish. And if he can keep us distracted in all these symptoms, we'll never deal with the root cause. Because he knows if we deal with the root, he's out. And God can be glorified in a way that he doesn't want God to be glorified. See, we have to see this as a spiritual warfare issue before we see it as a physical human issue. I tell men all the time, especially in the African American community, because we want to blame the systemic issues of our culture. And there are some issues. They are real. But those are the symptoms. The root is, Satan has read Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And he realizes that Adam has the role of headship. So Satan, like your favorite football team, has studied the opposing team's plan. Has come up with a plan of his own to what? 
hinder the progress of that plan. If God wants to work through the man to get the family, what would be your solution if you were Satan for a minute? Go ahead, be Satan, just for a minute, just for a minute. <laughs> what would you do when you get the man out the home? Rather than trying to get the man, then the woman, then the kids, get the man, I got everybody else. It's a spiritual issue before it's a physical issue. But all we see is what? Because some of y'all don't want to be too charismatic Pentecostal. <laughs> but we need to be biblical. There is a legitimate, real spiritual warfare that is going on. And Satan is very clear on what God's plans are. The problem is he knows we're not clear. Because if we were clear, we would know that our battle is really against <coughs> heavenly principalities in high places. The physical stuff is just a fallout of what's going on in the spirit. So men and many minority communities are being locked up. Yes, there are systemic issues. Yes, there are laws that are not fair. Yes, 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 yes. But really behind all that is Satan getting the man out the home. So he can destroy the family. And a margin of protest won't fix that problem. Getting on our knees and praying and putting our armor on and fulfilling the Great Commission and going into all the world and making disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to reserve all things in the power of the Holy Spirit. That will change things. Amen. So we, we deal with Genesis. I think we got it. Unity and diversity. <coughs> So then we have multi-ethnic diversity and salvation. And I'll just highlight these. I'll break these down a little bit more what's going on throughout the weekend. Let's turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We have fun yet? Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. I like that <laughs> I can come in and preach. I like to do an active teaching. I like to go back and forth. I can, I can go with this now. Okay. <laughs> I can go home now. Go home. <laughs> 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 Romans chapter 5. Uh, the basis for my gospel based reconciliation really comes out of this text in Romans chapter 5, especially verses 6 through 11. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Who did he die for? Yes. Any ungodly people in here? Yes. yes. Well, maybe you used to be ungodly. You're not ungodly now. But you've been previously ungodly, right? Yes. And he died for what? Yes. Ungodly people. So before they got, before we got right, Christ, in God's plan, preordained before the foundation of the world, had already died. He didn't die when you believed. I'm going somewhere with this. We're going somewhere. I got to do my case, all right? I'm like Perry Mason. I got to do my case. I got to do my case. <laughs> he says, verse up, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us. And while we got ourselves together, <laughs> when we came to the knowledge of who he was, while we were still what? So when did God demonstrate his love toward us? So why don't we follow his lead? This is why the gospel is really a solution to this issue. If God demonstrated his love towards us while we were still sinners, then we need to demonstrate our love towards one another and the sinners while they're still sinners, and we're still learning how to become saints. The problem is we don't love each other like God loved us. 
we love people we have stuff in common with. We have we love stuff that people we like. We love stuff people who, who who are like us, who look like us, who were raised where we were raised. We don't love people who are totally honest with us. See, God was holy, holy, holy. We were sinners, 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 but he demonstrated his love to us before we became holy, holy, holy. We had nothing in common with God. There was nothing about you that God should have loved you. But he demonstrated his love towards you while you were still lost in sin. And continues to do so now that you're a saint. Any professors in here? I know there's some pastors. Any professors? I've asked this question before I dropped into bombshell. And, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't use the phrase at our church, sinners saved by grace. I, I don't use that phrase. Because when you read Paul's letter, he never writes to the sinners at Ephesus. In a sense, the sinners at Corinth, he writes to the saints. Because he writes, writes to them based on their new position, not the practice. So I use the phrase, saints who still have the ability to sin. Because that's my new title. You're not a sinner anymore if you're a saint. Hello. <laughs> you are in darkness and now you are in the light. Don't sound like the same thing to me. You are in the kingdom and the rule of Satan, now you're in the kingdom and the rule of God. Don't sound like the same two people. You were in one realm, Paul says. Now you're in a new realm. Don't sound like the same two people. So why are we using the old title for new people? Let me tell you something about my sinfulness. I don't know about yours. If you give me any excuse to sin, my flesh is going to take it and run with it. So I can't think sin. I have to think saint because now I have to act like a saint. But if I think sinner, I'm going. My flesh is going to say, "What? You got an excuse for sin? The two are not the same. The sinner is unredeemed. The sinner is redeemed. I mean, saint is redeemed. That's not the same people. The sinner has not been purchased with the blood of Christ. The saint has been purchased with the blood of Christ. That's not the same people." Then where we get that from? See, I was the type of student who would ask questions. You just couldn't tell me anything. <laughs> you just couldn't say anything and not mean I have a question if it didn't sound like. Right. You know where we got that from? History. But it ain't, it's not in the Bible. When God saved you, he changed your name based on your new position. And we have examples of this all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? <laughs> Abraham became who? <laughs> because his relationship with God changed. <laughs> you see how I get this? Sarah Rod became Sarah. because her relationship with God changed. <laughs> Saul became <laughs> because his relationship <laughs> But why didn't your name change when you got saved? <laughs> You have a new position. You're in a new relationship. You are not what. But God demonstrated His own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. So we're not even under His wrath anymore. So why do you want that old title that carries all that? I want the new title because I have new life. This is all throughout the epistles. Paul talks about this in Colossians also. He talks about it in Ephesians. We miss it. For when we were, what? Verse 10. Enemies. You were enemies before you got saved. So you want to keep the old title that was an enemy and not the new title that now you're his friend and his child. Is this making sense to anybody but me? <laughs> we 
were his enemies. Now, most of the people you know don't believe God that they're at war with God. But they are. They may not be at war with God, but God is at war with them. We were his enemies. And you mean now that I'm saved, I'm still his enemy? No. Then why am I using that old title? We were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only, not only that, but we also rejoice in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we have now received the reconciliation. And that's why I get gospel-based reconciliation from. Right? We have been reconciled by the gospel. And it includes all that. We are not what we used to be. Then why are we behaving like we still are what we used to be? And Paul would answer that question in Romans chapter 6. There's some things you don't know that you should know. Do you not know? Obviously they didn't know. That's all he's asking them. Do you not know? That sin no longer has any legitimate authority over you. I'm preaching through 1 Corinthians at our church. I'll be there for probably the next three or four years. <laughs> it takes me a while. But Paul first addresses who they are in Christ before he deals with their behavior. Because your position should drive your practice. We're trying to get people to practice something they don't understand their position. He always starts with the position first. He always starts with what God has done through Christ for them first before he deals with their practice. And I'm afraid we're trying to call people to act like saints who are still sinners. That's the name of that moment, yes. Let's yes. okay. run to this very quickly. So much to say, so I'm going to say so little time to say. Thank you, sweetie. Let me know it's 815 now. I do my honor. Universal problem of humanity and sin. Look at chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as though one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus the death spread to all men because all sin. So sin has affected how much of humanity? Oh. Now, for you Greek students, for you Aramaic students, you Hebrew students, if you study all in any language, all means oh. <laughs> So we all have the same universal problem of your humanity in sin. Everybody is born in sin, shaken and lifted by the very, some of us live it out a little worse than others, but we're equally sinful or sinners. We're all totally depraved, even though we may not live out our depravity equally. Recently in our country, we've had some racial strife. Uh, it, it'll be back around, just keep, keep living. It always comes down for a while and it comes right back. Because we get all excited and we want to have all these powwows and all these meetings and then everything calms down and we don't meet anymore. And then something breaks out and we want to meet again and all. Churches call me, can you come and talk to us about this? Because they don't call so much now and everything's calmed down. So I just wait. Because <laughs> like a boomerang is coming back. So we all have that common problem of sin. That's why sin is the problem. Listen, you're not the problem. I know that. My story for baseball and cop, I knew he wasn't the problem. Just because he was white and I was black, he's not the problem. Sin is the problem. And we don't all live out our total depravity equally, but we all are totally depraved before Christ. So why... Are the things happening in our culture? Why are the things happening in our church? Because people are totally depraved. Why does a man sit on a man's neck for nine minutes? It's not because he's got a uniform on. It's not even because he's white. It's because he's got depravity in his heart. He either has depravity that's gone amok, 
he is demon possessed or he's working the agenda of some pimp hate group that wants to cause distress in our culture that's the reason because I know people that are the same color as the man he was sitting on their neck sitting on somebody's neck that looks just like them it's a sin problem not a skin problem now don't get me wrong our culture and our country has promoted some ungodly things. But like Paul, I'm not into shadow boxing. I know who the problem is. I know what the problem is. And all of us in this room should know the same who and the same problem because you got the same Bible I got. But we listen to the message of the culture. We listen to talk show radio. We listen to CBN and all the other alphabet TV stations don't know what they're talking about. Because they have an agenda that has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. I could go to Washington and tell them exactly what's wrong. They just don't want to hear it. But unfortunately, the church doesn't want to hear the truth either. Because we got some issues in our heart. That coming to Christ and the blood has not gotten to yet. We were raised with some attitudes and some thoughts and some ways that we haven't dealt with in our own hearts yet. And so we keep distances from one another. I'm going to heaven with you, I just don't want to deal with your heart. And in heaven, I'll be glorified, so I can't have those attitudes. But before you get glorified, you're supposed to be getting sanctified. Both supposed to produce the same result. One is the eternal work, one is the practical work here on earth. And we're getting people saved, maybe. But we don't talk much about sanctification anymore. Sin is really not that bad. Because we're all sinners. Saved by grace. We're only human, ain't nobody perfect. But are you being perfected? What is the direction of your life? No, none of us are perfect. Or are you even going the right direction? Don't tell me you're going south and I know you're going north. I'm, I'm a move, in my heart, I'm moving south, but your feet going north. So your heart is not the issue. The issue is your feet, your practice. Universal principle of humanity is death. What is the result of sin? Death. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the first Adam, death reigns. And sin now reigns as the last part of Genesis chapter 3 teaches us. And everybody is not just born a sinner. Everybody is born eternally separated from God. Dead. I don't care what your shade is. You got that problem. Before you come to Christ. I don't care how much money. I don't care what class. I don't care what level you've lived at. Or have not lived at. Everybody has that problem. Before Christ. Sounds like we got a lot in common. But we let the outside appearance control everything. Yeah, I, come to us. I don't know if anybody ever told you this. I'm sure Pastor Schultz preached on this. I know he's a good man of God. And I know he preaches the Bible. But did you know that Satan is not a racist? <laughs> <laughs> He's welcoming everybody. <laughs> Do you know hell will not be segregated? I don't know if anybody ever told you that, but I'm just telling you, it's not segregated. There's not a black part of hell. There's not a white part of hell. There's not a Hispanic part of hell. There's not a Korean part. You just go to hell. Some of y'all don't want to leave heaven if you weren't glorified because it's not segregated. 
Does anybody know what time the uh, Baptist people will be meeting in heaven? <laughs> Surely the Baptists will not be meeting with the Presbyterians and the Pentecostals and the Charismatics. <laughs> you do want to know what time you're going to be in service, don't you? Because <laughs> you know when the Pentecostals come that are really saved in Christ Jesus, they're going to be doing stuff that we don't do in Baptist churches. <laughs> denomination will Jesus be voting for in heaven? Or will we all just be gathered around the throne? Who have been washed in the blood? Who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of our sin? And will we all just worship him together? Why don't we do that Universal predicament of humanity is sin and death reigns. We talked about that in verse 14. The gospel demands a new ethnic, a new view of ethnic relationship by Christians. And I'm going to preach through this on Sunday. Uh, we'll get into kind of detail. But Sunday I'll give you the helicopter view of Romans chapter 12. And it's a, it's a principle that's often missed in verses 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 12. Anybody know Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2? What is it? What is that? Oh, come on, man. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and suffer unto God, which is your spiritual service, and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the good and suffer the perfect will of God. Now, if you go back and read chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans, what he's really talking about there, because the rest of that chapter proves this, is that Jews and Gentiles no longer look at each other the way they used to look at each other before Christ. We, thought, we make that about getting your mind together. That's not what he's talking about. Go read back and read chapter 9, 10, and 11. The Jews have rejected Christ. God has temporarily set them aside and grafted in the Gentiles. And now the Jew and Gentile are no longer separated. They're not going to be together. But they got some old history and some old ways of looking at each other. And he said, don't bring that up into this new reality. And then he goes and tells them in the rest of the book how to live that out. Because the gospel demands a new view of ethnic relations by Christians. He covers this in Ephesians chapter 2, right? In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile relations, right? Male nor female. It's not that those, those, those ethnic groups and those genders are eliminated. They are no longer to be dividing us. Now that we're in Christ. And this is all over the Bible. All over. It's always been God's desire for all men and women of every ethnic group to come to him. But ultimately that reality is found in Christ and his body. And Jesus prays that prayer in his high priestly prayer in John 17. And he talks about those who will come after the disciples. He prays for us. We weren't even on the scene yet, but he's praying that we be one as he and the Father are one. And by our unity, the unsaved would believe that God has sent him and that he is the Son of God. By our disunity, they'll question. They won't believe. So, go back to be Satan for just a minute. If you know that, what are you going to try to do to the church? Keep it as your fire. So that people will not believe that Jesus 
is the Son of God. And be saved. See, this, this is not about us, brothers and sisters. We've made it about us far too long. We've got to change. And our time is almost like, Martha is diversity of congregation. Are the church is supposed to be diversified? Your local church? See, most of you ain't got a problem when we get to heaven. I'll be glorified, and, and I won't be able to resist. <laughs> They'll be forced upon me, and I'll be glorified, and I won't have my sin nature. <laughs> but I believe the Bible teaches that the local church is supposed to be multi -ethnic. The Wall of Division versus the Bridge of Unity, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 22. The veil that separated them in the temple for one another has been torn down in Christ. Let's go there. <coughs> Can't read all of it. Can't break it down like I want to. Just don't have that time. <laughs> but you can read it when you go home. Verse 11, therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcised by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope without God in the world. Listen, God only had two people groups in the Bible, Jews and everybody else. Any Jews in here? No. Y'all Gentiles. Y'all far from the commonwealth of God. Far from all the promises of God. The cross of Christ died and brought you near. And Jews now must believe in Christ. And Gentiles must believe in Christ. And now we got one church. If your community is ethnically diverse, your church should be. If your job is ethnically diverse, your church should be. I used to get in trouble in seminary because going to Midwestern where I went to school and, and seminary, a lot of the guys were from rural communities. And their first thing is, well, ain't no people around us that don't look like us. I said, well, then what partnerships are you developing to bridge that? You're close to some city. What partnership are you developing with a pastor so you guys build a relationship so you get to know his hurts, his wounds, his struggles, and he gets to know your hurts, your wounds, your struggle, and your people are coming together seeing you guys do that. It's not one size fits all, but everybody has to do something. you got to figure out what you can do in the context that you're in but you got to do something that reflects the multi-ethnic congregational view of God. And your church has to figure that out. And you got to teach your people how to figure that out. But to stay segregated when God Christ died to unite us is not the way. Well, you know, people, people, people don't want those kind of people in our church. What kind of people? Sinners? Are they leaving? They don't want to save people in your church? Is that what you're saying? What are we really saying? Well, I might have to come out my comfort zone. God didn't come out his comfort zone to save you. You're wretched, wicked, evil, tongue, full of poison and apps. He holy, 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 and he still demonstrates his love towards you. Why? And you won't come out your comfort zone for a fellow human being. Yeah, that's the one of quiet moments. <laughs> that's not a hate moment, that's a meditate moment. <coughs> what are we doing? Listen, there is no plan B. If the church doesn't do it, there is no other option. The world will never do it. They're totally depraved. They're selfish. They're dead in sins and trespasses. 
They love the things of this world. They love themselves. We're the people who are willing to deny ourselves, pick up our cross daily, and follow them. You can read the rest of that. He talks about how Christ brought us near and all that Christ did. And if Christ did that, what do we do in separating ourselves again? And we'll learn tomorrow that love really drives all this. Not any old kind of love, the love of God. And if you don't have the love of God, you're not interested in any of this. Because you love yourself more than you love God. So, before we can talk about loving our neighbor, let's get love right. Do I love you like God has loved me? And if I understand all my perfections and all my weaknesses and all my issues, and He loves me before the foundations of the world, he decided to demonstrate his love. How can I hold back my love from my fellow man? If he's forgiven me of all my sins, how can I hold back forgiveness from you? For your sins. Or the sins of your people. Or the sins of the past. That's why CRT is such a demonic strategy. Anything that says my wife or any of you cannot be forgiven because of the history of your kid folk and what they did to black folk don't understand the gospel. And that philosophy has no business in the household of God among God's people if it's teaching that. Now a lot of those people just want revenge for what's been done in the past. You need to understand that. You hurt us, we want to hurt you. But that's not what Christians do. Christians, and this is I think our last point, are to be ambassadors of reconciliation. Ambassadors of reconciliation. Let's look at the Corinthians and we're done. Thank you for your patience. Second Corinthians verse 12, chapter 5, verse 12. For we do not commit ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. Or if we are sound mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ compels. That can be either the love for Christ or the love of Christ, depending on your translation or interpretation. But either way, love is supposed to be compelling you. compels us because we judge us that if one died for all, then all die. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on we regard no one according to the flesh. I don't look at your outside shade and judge you. Whether I want to relate with you or whether I want to have fellowship with you or whether I want to witness to you. Not that the love of Christ is compelling me. Not that God's love for me is compelling me. I no longer recognize you based on your outside fleshly characteristics. Verse 7, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All those old cultural Samaritans, Jews, Gentile designations, gone. Gone. Verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteous of God. We're bachelors. We're sick ones. You don't get to vote on this. An ambassador, an emissary of the king, goes at the behest of the king. 
And it goes with the message of the king. We are ambassadors of Christ. Sent with a message, the gospel of reconciliation. And it's not based on who you are, what you look like, what you don't look like, who you're not, what class or culture or creed you are. It's based on the fact that you're a human being and you have the same common problem that all human beings have. You are lost in sin, shaded in iniquity, by your very nature, you're a child of wrath, but I got some good news for you. Jesus died to reconcile you. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity. We pray that you take these words, these principles, and drive them home to our heart. Have your will, have your way. Glorify yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank mm -hmm. you.